Oh, that's smart. Yeah. That's smart. I'm gonna record mine. <laughs> See, I'm learning. That's why. That's one of the reasons why I'm so excited to be here. I showed up to scope it out. And I got to watch Angela. And Angela all the hair and all the hair. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. even better than just coming and trying to. Yeah. 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 I did a tutorial. I'll watch you. It was I'll a watch tutorial. You. It was. A tutorial. I'll watch it. the other once I attend, and then on Thursday, I'll know how to do it. And there's Mexican candy if you want to know what it is. <laughs> Okay, I guess we'll get started. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Angela George, and this is my thesis, La Frontera Within. So an outline of the presentation, uh, first, what my argument is, the thesis itself, the framework I used, and then we'll dive into the ethnographic interviews on identities that were a main part of my research, and then kind of break those down by the phonology in them, and then also location, and then my takeaways from the project itself. So the thesis is here, and you can see it's in Spanish. This was a bilingual project, and so you'll see a lot of Spanish on the slides. I'll make sure that I translate it <laughs> uh, for the English speakers in the room. So what this is saying is that the role of being a Chicana today, and I'll explain what a Chicana is, the role of being a Chicana today in this time and space is the act of embracing fluency of Spanish at all levels of acquisition, defending Chicana and Chicano bodies in academia, mm -hmm. and then fighting for the ability to hold all parts of yourself at the same time. And so a timeline of this project, this project has been eight years in the making. <laughs> My first Spanish class was in 2014. And a common question that they ask in a Spanish class is, ¿Por qué quieres aprender español? Why do you want to learn Spanish? And my answer was always to reconnect with family and then eventually interview my grandmother about her immigration story. And so in 2018, I started my Spanish minor here at Gonzaga. And in 2021, I did my first interview for a phonology class with my mentor, uh, with my tia Araceli in uh, Juarez, where she lives in El Paso. And then in 2022, I did interview my grandmother for this project. And now we're here. So <laughs> El Marco, uh, the framework of this project is Chicana feminism. And so why did I choose Chicana feminism? This is a Mexican story. So I wanted to make sure that I was using a Mexican framework to support that story. It's also about decolonizing academia, both body and mind. A lot of ethnographic research is done from like a Western perspective, a white perspective. So I wanted to make sure that that Mexican part of it was being highlighted for the whole time. And then it's also the female experience. All of my interviewees were women in my family. And so I wanted to make sure that I was highlighting that experience too. And so who is a Chicana? A Chicana is a Mexican American, and it's like a way of differentiating, differentiating the identity as something new. It's not just Mexican, it's not just American. You can't separate those. It's a new identity in itself. It also has this element of community where um, Chicanas, like they're always reaching out to each other and supporting each other. And so that's part of it as well. And then there's also an element of activism where we're always fighting to support each other, share our culture, and um, just gain more rights in society. Um, and so a big cornerstone of my thesis was Gloria Anseldua's work, Borderlands La Frontera, which is kind of where the title of my thesis comes from. And so a big quote that kind of threaded through my whole thesis was this one. Alienated from her mother culture, alien and the dominant one, the woman of color does not feel safe within the inner life of herself. 
Petrified, she can't respond, her face caught between los intersticios, the spaces between the different worlds she inhabits. And so interstices is the spaces between. And I felt like that word really encapsulated what it means to be Chicana. And I kept kind of returning to that word throughout the whole thesis. And so you'll kind of keep hearing that. So let's get into Las Entrevistas, the interviews. So who and why? I interviewed my family. I interviewed my mama Angie, who's my grandmother, uh, my tia Oki and tia Arisa, or tia Bell, those are my aunts. My mom, Claudia, who's on the Zoom. <laughs> and then my cousin, Yesenia, who um, she's a little bit older than me, she's a millennial. And so I wanted to learn about the history of my family. Uh, before this project started, I didn't even know where my grandmother was from. And she's from Tepechilán, Zacatecas. And so <laughs> that was really important. You can see her here. This is a picture of all of us making tamales, which is one of like the first memories that really stuck with me. And I keep coming back to this picture because food always unites people and especially family. And then I also thought my family is a very interesting case study for language acquisition. My grandmother predominantly speaks Spanish even to the day, even though she's lived in the United States since her early 20s. Versus like my Tia Oki and Tia Bella, and my mom, they're all bilingual. But my Tia Oki, she lived for the first 14 years of her life in Mexico. And so she learned English much later. And then my Tia Bella and my mom, they learned English in kindergarten. So the bilingualism started earlier, but still Spanish in the household. And then my cousin Yesenia, she's very confident in her bilingual uh, identity and bicultural identity, um, but there's still that bilingualism. And then me, <laughs> I like didn't learn Spanish in the household. So just kind of like that huge arc of different levels of language acquisition. And so onto the phonologia, the phonology in the interviews. So I was kind of analyzing the impacts of English on these different levels of Spanish in my family. And so these are the three things that I found, and I'll explain each of these. La Bechica, code switching, and up top. And so what is La Bechica? La Bechica is more common in women and those with higher English proficiency. And so an example is vamos, where you hear the B, versus vamos. And so vamos is B labial, where you use both your lips to make that sound versus vamos where your teeth touch your lips. And so if you're pronouncing Spanish correctly, <laughs> you would do it vamos. But in each interview, even with my grandmother who predominantly speaks Spanish, I heard this happen in all of them. And so what that tells me is that it's not about your comfortability with the language. It's just that the impact of English is inevitable once you come here. And so next, code switching. So we're gonna to listen to this clip from my cousin Yusinia. And so some of these I dubbed over so you can understand, and some of them I'll explain after, but you can hear where she switched into English, so I didn't have to dub it over for you anymore. And so Yesenia, more than anyone else that I interviewed, used code switching, even though I explicitly said in the interviews we would be doing them in Spanish. And I think what that says is that she's very comfortable with that um, bilingual identity and that it's just part of her, it's inseparable. And so of course she would switch into English when she needs it. And uh, another thing she highlighted in her interview was that she'll use the language that corresponds with her emotions. So if she's angry, she'll maybe switch into Spanish, or if it's like something very personal like that, and it makes sense, then she'll switch into English. And what that clip was talking about was her family in Mexico, not always accepting that she is Mexican. And so <laughs> she got a little emotional explaining that story. And then of course, continuity. And this was something I saw a little bit in all the interviews was, if there's a forgotten word, they would just switch into the language they remembered it. And so next we'll move into UpTalk. And I was first introduced to UpTalk in my first phonology research, which UpTalk is common with rezas. And what it is is when you go up 
at the end of your sentence. And the connotation in English is like kind of unprofessional, but for fresas, who are women that live on the border of El Paso and Juarez, it's more about community and uh, creating this shared identity. The reason they have it is that in their speech is that they're mimicking valley girl speech. So what it's showing is that they're part of a higher economic class that has access to English and can understand English speaking shows. And so they're mimicking that in their speech. And so what was interesting is that I found a talk in both of these interviews with my mom and my tío Bell, and they're not presas. So we're going to listen to these, and you can kind of see the graph to help you notice where the up top is. So this is my mom, Claudia. That one's a little quieter. And then this one's Tia Bell. And so you could hear it in both of theirs. And my theory on this, and of course it's a very small sample, <laughs> is that they don't speak Spanish in the household. Um, and so there might be like more of a delayed switch into the language. Um, and they're kind of using Spanish as a tool. So they speak Spanish with other Spanish speakers. And so there might be some question of if they're speaking right, like, huh. right? Um, and so there's just that delayed switch. And so I didn't see it with Yesenia because she's always speaking Spanish or a combination of Spanish and English. Or my tia Ofi, who explicitly said she'll always use Spanish if she can. And she speaks it in the household. And then my mama Angie, who pretty much 100% of the time speaking Spanish. And so next we move on to location, location. And so I was really curious about the impact of location on identity and the Spanish speaking, um, because we're looking at immigration, we're looking at just moves in general and people living in different areas. And so how is that impacting their Spanish and how is that impacting their identity? And so what I first noticed was community and connection. So most of my family is living in LA, but my mom, she moved to Minnesota. And so there's not that same community of biculturalism and bilingualism, and there's not that same culture in Minnesota. So she's really had to go and find her community once she moved. And I really noticed that more, and we'll talk about it in a little bit. And then my mama Angie, of course she moved from Mexico to here, but then also more recently she moved to Yuba City from LA, and there's just not that same bilingualism and Spanish speaking in the neighborhood that she's in. And she's a lot older, so she's not moving around very much. And so when I was talking to her when I visited, she was just explaining how she felt more isolated because she couldn't talk to her neighbors in her language. Mm -hmm. So definitely locations impacting there. And then there's that separation of identity. So if you're at home, you're speaking Spanish at home, there's gonna be a separation in your identity when you go to school and now it's in English. And so we'll talk about that a little bit too. And then, yeah, so just that continuity of bilingualism in all these interviews really uh, was dependent on location. So physical division. And so this is another clip and all these clips, or at least some of them are in my podcast. And so there'll be a link to that at the end, but this one is my mom again. And so for her to bring that up like years and years and years later, you can see how like hard that like microaggression um, really like dug in. And it really emphasizes how different it is when you're learning English at school and trying to bring in your culture mm -hmm. and then just being met with that wall where it's like, you know, you're in a separate location. And so your identity is also going to be separated. And she brought up this like clip from Encanto where um, he's drinking coffee and he's a little hyper. <laughs> so I thought I put that in there. And so my mom's like 
a very strong example of like having that separation of identity, a physical separation. But she's also a great example of representation. She is the first Latina um, of the school board in Northfield, Minnesota. And so she's really overcoming that physical border that she's met with. And she's been really reaching out since moving to Northfield. And she just is very inspirational to me. She's a community leader and mm -hmm. she's done amazing work just including that Hispanic language across everything that she does. And so lastly, we'll talk about independence. And so this is gonna focus more on my grandmother's story arc or life story. So first of course, there's the immigration, 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 where um, that's an incredible story within itself. She moved by herself when she was about 20. So like the ages of most of the people in this room. And um, she, she didn't know the language when she came and she found a job. She even paid for her own, for her mother's house back in Mexico. She like paid it off. And it was just like incredible to me that she was supporting her family in Mexico, a new family in the United States. And that just shows incredible independence. But then also this clip, which we'll listen to here. And so this is one of the last things that I got on the recording. I was about to turn it off. And then Freddie, who's someone that lives with her, started jogging her memory about the story where she was, like when she was a child running through the streets of her city. And she was the first woman to wear pants in her city. So she was like talking about how people are like, going like, oh my God, look at her running, like, get on the pantalona, like, just like ridiculing her. And she's like a complete, spectacle but then she went on to say that she bought even more pants after that <laughs> <laughs> so that just shows like from the beginning she's been like a super independent woman and i think her thread of independence goes to my mother who's like moved away from her hometown and and then to me as well so just like this thread throughout our whole family of independence and of course she just continues to speak spanish and i think that shows that she's refuse to like gain that English language because she's independent and she can go without it. So that's on her. So we reached the conclusiones, the conclusion. Uh, so personal impact, connecting to heritage, relearning what fluency is and acting in resistance. So here's from our trip to Yuba City um, or my trip to Yuba City to visit her. And so these, this whole project has really started a conversation within my family. I got to reconnect with people that I hadn't talked to in a long time, including my mom, Angie. I hadn't seen her in probably like five or six years. Um, it was a very validating experience. And across the interviews, I kept hearing things that I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense for me. Like, I've been feeling that. Um, and then just being able to talk to them about our shared identity. And then preservation without a shared language. I think a lot of my family wanted to preserve this story of immigration. Um, and then they also talked about how the language is getting lost across the generations. And so this project being a bilingual project really like preserved that story without requiring a shared language, which I think is really important for like younger generations. And then breaking down La Frontera and La Frontera means like the borderland. So like, I really felt like a physical division in my identity being separated from my family. Um, and then also metaphorical division. So having these conversations really started breaking that down for me. And then uh, it also helped me relearn like fluency and acting in resistance. So sharing culture, that's what this presentation is. Um, and also transcending linguistic ability. Like I was able to share a part of my thesis, which is a poem at La Raza um, Festival this year. And it was pretty scary because like, Spanish is not my first language, but the poem was in Spanish. So just getting over that, where like it's not about like your level of comfortability, it's just about um, being able to learn and being comfortable at where you're at. And so there's that. 
And then also just creating space, like that's also what the poem was, that's what this project is. And acting resistance, like, uh, sorry, you're all part of it. <laughs> um, just like creating that space in academia with this project uh, is part of that resistance. So just a thank you. If you want to listen to the podcast part of this thesis, it's, uh, that's the Spotify code, or you can go to my website. Um, and then just another thank you to my mentor, Dr. Christina Isabelli. And uh, yeah, I'll take any questions. Um, I was really struck by, I'm glad you had a very beginning where you sort of started by saying that this, this project has been to eight years in the making. Um, <laughs> and going back to your first Spanish class and then thinking about Angelua and how she writes about the importance of the mother tongue. And I'm just wondering if you have any reflections on your relationship to Spanish given that it is sort of both your mother tongue in, in some really powerful ways and also not your first language. Yeah, I think like that was one of the big things that I had to get over <laughs> in this project. Um, there's definitely like a division when you're like, I am with people that look like me and they're speaking a language and I understand what they're saying, but I'm not fully comfortable like speaking it myself. And in all the inter well, in a lot of the interviews, I asked like, do you consider yourself fluent in Spanish? And me, like I would consider all my family fluent in Spanish. Um, but there was a lot of hesitation with responding to that question. Um, even my PFL, she's like, well, like of course, like I've grown up with it, but like I, I don't want to like say that I'm fluent. And the same with my mom. She's like, there's holes in my Spanish, like I'm gonna say I'm fluent. Um, and so that's kind of where I realized like, oh, like it's okay that I'm not fluent either. Like we're all like figuring out what it means to speak Spanish together. So definitely just realized like, we don't have to be perfect, of course. So um, yeah, I've definitely like accepted like it's okay that I didn't acquire it in the home. And the important part is that like I'm trying to learn. <laughs> yeah, so this is just amazing for me because I think I met your mom about 30, 31 years ago. And I think I met your grandmother about 27 years ago. And it's incredible. I don't know if you can Claudia hear me. She, <clears throat> she had the audio access <clears> there. <throat> um, she might be able to. I can hear. I can hear Matt. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's it's just incredible for me to see you, you know, standing here. Um, I kind of have a hope that in you know thirty years, I mean, one of your kids will be here, and I'll <laughs> hear my wheelchair. <laughs> but um, so I think the journey of, of your family is remarkable, um, geographically, linguistically, and um, and. Um, I, what I'm curious about is what to you is most compelling or captivating about your mom and your grandmother in terms of their respective journeys. Yeah, I think just having that journey to begin with, because like um, for my PFL and my PLP and PSNA, like they all wanted to stay in LA and they love LA. And, and of course, my family does too. Um, but being like taking that step to move away from your hometown and your homeland, like that's something that a lot of people never do. Like some people never move away from their hometown. And I think like my mom's grown a lot because of that. And she's made so many friendships like across the globe. <laughs> and then my mom and Angie, like, of course, like she's created a whole new life here and generations and generations of new people that have grown up here. So I think being able to move away and then missing home and then coming back to it and revisiting those people, but then um, finding new people, I think that's the part that 
really inspired me to just keep exploring and keep adventuring and 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 that's why i'm not scared to do it either because i've seen my mom do it and my grandmother do it too and what do you feel like your home is uh yeah that was another question i asked people is like what is home to you and there's a there was a whole nother thesis on this <laughs> um so it is a very complicated question and i do struggle with where home is for me because now we've moved away from my hometown um, and I probably will never go back there. And I'm about to move away from this new home. So <laughs> I think mostly what I found in the interviews and what I think of myself is like home is just the people you're with and um, who make you feel comfortable. And so that's how I would define my place. I'm probably moving somewhere that I won't have a home to begin with, but uh, hopefully I'll find it. So. <laughs> Where is my one? Hello. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about your title and why you would like that. Yeah, La Frontera Within. So, well, one, I liked it because it's like um, bilingual as a title. So that kind of helps encapsulate the project just in three words. And then La Frontera Within, like for a long time, I just felt like this separation in myself, like La Frontera is the borderland. And so I felt like there was a borderland inside of myself where I was having to cross a lot just to like connect with my Mexican identity. And it was really difficult for me to just even claim that Mexican identity for a long time. Like I didn't feel confident in that. Um, and I would usually code switch into like the white part of myself just to be like, okay, like, I'll just blend in with the thing I know. So, and it would kind of hide away like the Mexican part of myself. Um, and so uh, I think that just like made me feel much more comfortable to be able to like encapsulate like that borderland in the title. And then also talk about how it's like a metaphor, but then also literally part of the history of my family. And so that history is in myself as well. Um, so yeah, I think, and then it was also like a full circle thing where at the very end of my thesis, I was able to talk about how it has broken down and I don't feel that strong of that border in myself anymore now that I've spent a year reflecting about my identity. So I think that's really helped me too. So yeah, that's why. I, and then also just a calling back to Anselvila with her title, La, La Frontera. So yeah, does that answer it? <laughs> It's almost like you're lost in how the American identity sometimes mandates it that you get things up. You know, I'm also just in the generation because the idea of trying to kind of capture these stories from the past in some form, um, though they always kind of continue to go away, right? Even how you jog your grandmother's memory, like it's one of these things we've actually struggled with with most of our elders. Like they lost some things over time. Um, but this idea that America, which is particularly for the older generation, really demanded kind of becoming American. And your grandmother goes into that is remarkable. But are you finding with your generation that this is embraced more? That when you can say, I'm you know, bilingual, would you kind of thing out? Like, I mean, I think today it would be like a benefit of a the place, but do you still find that there is still this kind of imposition of, you know, you're an American, therefore? Mm -hmm. Um, I think like there's definitely, I, I think there's like real research on um, bicultural, biracial people will code switch into like the dominant culture. And so even if they don't want to say that they feel that pressure, like there is just that inherent pressure to code switch into that white part of yourself if you have it or as white passing as you can be. And so same with language. And I was talking about this in an interview for someone else's project, is that like on Gonzaga's campus, like we don't have Spanish signage. And so how can you say like you're accepting like the last Latina students and Latino students on campus when you don't have any physical representation of their language or any other language that's spoken on campus? Mm -hmm. So you're actually you physically are forcing people to use that. Uh, English speaking part of themselves. So I think like that's one place that we can improve a lot and 
Um, that's part of the work that's been happening in, in Minnesota is where any of their festivals or like parades and stuff, they will have like the Spanish translation. And that's just like so easy to be like, we want to bring in this community. We want you to be part of the traditions. And so we're going to share the space, the physical space on our signs with you all. So very early in the presentation, you talked about how um, this was a, a, a small act of decolonizing academia. Um, and I know how passionate you are about that project. Can you talk a little bit more about how you see the work you've done with you and your family's personal story as an act of decolonizing? Yeah, so I think like, first of all, just having that space for those stories. Um, Academia. I think like even with this project, everyone's thesis is in English. So I like asked Dr. T at the beginning if I could write the paper in Spanish. And I felt like it's a story for it's a story of Mexican history. And so it should be written in the language that's accessible by the people it's about and prioritizing their needs over the rest of the academic space, I think is just one way to push the they are just as equal and they're just as deserving mm -hmm. of their history being represented and of their language being represented. And the fact that we think like automatically, like, oh, I'm writing this paper and I want it to be published, like it has to be in English because that's how most people will read it. Um, just breaking that down and being like, no, like <laughs> that's not the language that makes sense for this project. Um, and so just prioritizing that in the and like keep and I kept telling myself, I'm like, just use the language that makes sense for the part of the project you're working on. And just working on that in myself, where I was like, okay, not all academic things have to be in English. And I think that really helped me just be like, yeah, <laughs> these this language was here first, really. So uh, let's just prioritize that one being first. And of course, telling stories of people who generally speaking historically have not been in academia, the female body, the Mexican body, the Chicano body, giving us the full space and attention. Yeah. Yeah, I was just really making sure that I'm like, well, it's about my mom and Angie. Like, <laughs> she doesn't speak English. So, like, I want to make sure if she wanted to read it, she could. So, yeah, like, just really prioritizing the people who it's about. And that's how you decolonize things is giving it back to the people that were there first. Mm -hmm. When talking about the up walk, mm -hmm. you gave your theory about why that is. And could you explain a little more about what you mean by the delayed switch? Like, I was wondering if it was that each time, each individual time they speak Spanish, was there, did you mean that there was like a brief adjustment period of a few minutes and it would, it would go away after that and it was something else? I think for my mom, uh, it was less consistent across her interview. Like she uh, eventually was like using it less, so the examples were more in the beginning. Um, but then for my Tia Bell, like she used, she is just like in my mind, like I can always hear her like speaking with the laptop and it was more consistent across her interview. So I think it's, either a delayed switch, literally, where like you're just warming up and you have to switch your brain back to Spanish mode, but, or it could also be like just this switch where you've spent like your whole day, your whole time in your house speaking English, and now you're switching back into Spanish and you're just questioning everything you're saying a little bit and that's bleeding into the way you're speaking, which like is fine. Like everyone that I talked to is like, very happy to speak in Spanish and like excited at the opportunity to do so. Um, but there's always just going to be a little bit of a question when you don't speak it as your first default language. Do you have a favorite moment in your interviews or a favorite thing that you learned? Um, I think I definitely like the Pantalona story with my mom and Angie. Like I like, created that little graphic for it. I think. That was just exciting because the interview was just going on and on. It was like a 30 minute long interview and she was like going back to the same stories 
And I was like, well, maybe it's time to turn it off. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> you know how it is talking with old people. That's just how it is. But I, so that was just really incredible that she remembered that right at the last minute. Um, but then also talking with like my cousin Yathenia, like I thought that she was going to have a more similar experience to myself just because she's like part of the younger generation. That's she's much more like in that bilingual category versus like predominantly Spanish. Um, but she completely identified as Mexican. And even though she's lived in the United States, she's born in the United States, um, she completely rejected that American part of herself. And that was very interesting to me and kind of cued me into how the rest of the interviews were gonna go. And so actually like, I am the only person in my family that identifies as Chicana. And the rest of my interviewees all identified as Mexican or my mom is Mexican American. So that in itself has been like an interesting discovery and like hard to realize that like, uh, the work I'm doing is alone in that aspect. And so I do have to learn like how to balance those parts of my identity in a way that the rest of my family doesn't because they just are fully like in that Mexican part of their identity. So that was like, a really important moment just to realize like okay yeah <laughs> like I am like one of the only ones that is Mexican-American Chicana so that was really important to just because she was the first person I interviewed as well so I was like okay like this is how it's gonna go <laughs> uh Annabelle Hi, I was just curious when you were talking about your interview with Yesenia, you were saying that like different parts of like what she was talking about or the emotion she was feeling would like impact which language she spoke in. Mm -hmm. I was just curious because like this process for you has been like, you said Spanish wasn't your first language. So it's been like the process of like, you know, both diving into your family and kind of like learning about that while also like speaking in a language that's not native to you. So I'm just curious if like, based specifically on the research you did or the conversations you were having, if you found that now like different parts of your identity, you lean towards one language or the other, or like if you ever find yourself like thinking in Spanish about certain things versus English? Uh, yeah, great question. Uh, definitely after this project, I have been using Spanish words more in my speech just because I think it helps me like reaffirm my identity in like a little way all day. And so, just like leaning into that more and like kind of like how my cousin Yesenia is comfortable being in her bilingual identity and creating her own language in that way. I've like adopted the Spanish words into my speech to create my own version of the language. Um, and I think that's just been helpful, like a helpful discovery that it's like, it's okay to not be fully into one language or another, just embrace it in any way that you can. Um, mommy, you have a question? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm here. <laughs> um, I, I have two questions and you can answer them in whatever order you feel like. And then I also wanted to add a comment about the Chicana identity. Um, I noticed that recently you started adding an accent to your name. And I want to know um, when you decided that, how you, you know, like, what's the process that are you, like, are you introducing yourself? I didn't hear you or I forgot to notice if you introduced yourself as Angela at the beginning or if you're asking people to call you Angela um and I you know that's that's what I mean I named you in Spanish we named you in Spanish and I wanted to use that name and but it just became so easy because of that influence from the dominant language you know to just start calling you Angela so I wanted to hear about the accent on your name now and then also um, when you um, actively decided to identify um, as not white, but as bicultural or um, biracial, um, was it really in more recent years or did you have that, you know, understanding of yourself as more than just white in Norman, Oklahoma? And then, um, so you can answer those in any order. And then my comment about Chicana, I think there was a period, especially in college, where I did identify as Chicana, but I think that speaks to what you were saying earlier about the location, um, that when I left that community in California, 
just started identifying more as Mexican American. I think it was more accessible for people when I explained who I was to say Mexican American as opposed to Chicana. But um, obviously that that part of being Chicana, the, the activist part and that being always in your face with the people around you, this, you know, that I that I am, um, you know, both Mexican and American. And so and sometimes it's more American and sometimes it's more Mexican. But that's those are my questions for you. Thank you. Um, so I started putting the accent over the first A in my name this year. And it, it had been like a couple of years where I was thinking about it because on the Spanish keyboard it will like autocorrect with the accent. And so I decided it would be kind of like a slow rollout of my name. <laughs> Because uh, like my mom said, like I've been going by Angela for my whole life, so it's pretty jarring to just like immediately like switch to Angela. And even like in my own mouth, I'm like, is that like my name? Like, is that really like how I say it? Like, so kind of giving the option to the people that like I meet um, to see that in my email signature, to see that like on a presentation like this, like they can decide if they want to ask or if I feel like I'm gonna community that would be able to pronounce it correctly or feel comfortable pronouncing it in Spanish, then like they have that option as well. Um, but then also it just gives me the option as well, like because I have it there. So I'm like, well, I could just introduce myself as Angela and just go with that. And so it's just given me more flexibility in that identity, kind of the same way that the whole project is where it is almost like a bilingual name at this point. <laughs> so it could be either way. And then I started adopting like Chicana, I guess probably like junior year, I think more. Um, and a lot of it was just like, well, one, like the phonology class, like talking with like my tia Aratelli is like my first year or two from last spring. Um, that really helped me like be like, okay, I should really like start thinking about this more. And then also like some, a literature classes sophomore year like intersectionality like thinking about that and reading about people like choosing what parts they want to identify with and so thinking about that and then like anytime I fill out a form where it's like check white and then also check Latina like seeing that physical separation on the paper was also something that made me think about it more and and then finally like coming to the point of like rejecting that separation and being like, no, it's not something that's separable and I need to stop separating it in myself and I need to stop telling people that they can separate it. It's just something that is one word, one identity. So that's when I started using Chicana. The vamos versus vamos, and like the so one is the embodied nature of identity. Like, are you when you learn because there's Spanish, Spanish, there's Mexican, Spanish, and they're different, right? So, have you been trying to intentionally learn Mexican Spanish, and how how is that difficult to do? With I assume because that's a decolonization, most of what is taught is probably Spanish, Spanish, and then with the actual like phrasing, like um, so I'm trying to learn Italian, and my my vowels are all flat, right? I can't. I can't do it with my mouth. Like I'm gonna have to sit down and actually practice retraining my mouth. Is there any part of that for you? Like you physically have to like rethink how you do talking, which is what you do all the time, but you have to do it differently. Um, I think like it would be hard for me in this space to learn Mexican Spanish unless I was like spending a significant amount of time with Mexican community. Um, so like it is like really important to me to like get. To Mexico and live in Mexico and or live with like my family um, just to be surrounded by that version of the language um but then like uh, as back to that thing where like I accept like the level of language acquisition I have now and I like learn about it like with this project and and also part of American Mexican American Spanish is this like English influence on the on the pronunciation and so accepting that part too that like I am Mexican and American so my pronunciation is going to reflect that so I haven't like been changing the way I learn Spanish 
but I have been changing the way I think about honoring the sandwich. All right, uh, thank you everyone. <laughs>